All right. Hi, Ms. Garza. How are you doing? Good, good. Here. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you for meeting me. Sorry it's so late. Sorry it's, um, we had a crazy week. You want to tell me about your week? How did you feel? It was stressful. I'm not going to lie. It went, it went by quick, thankfully, but it was a lot. Yeah. But I'm glad it's at bay now. So this was your first year as a star math teacher in third grade. You took your first mock benchmark. Tell me how you felt about that. Going into it, I was I was pretty nervous. I I wasn't sure what to expect. I mean, like we're from we're very familiar with EdSide and we're very familiar with the programs that that we're using. But I think overall, because of the amount of questions, my kids are only used to the four the exit tickets, not yeah. anything more than ten. So, and then the new testing types, I was question types. I mean, it was very nerve wracking to see how they would answer. Mm -hmm. I guess. Like, did you notice anything? I did. I, I noticed on one of them. So they have done the inline choice before, which is like the drop down. Mm -hmm. But they had never had any that was multiple. So it was like one line and then a, another line. With I both. saw that. I saw yeah. that in the fourth grade math test as well. I had, I was, I wasn't expecting to see the question as on top of each other, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know how to format that on a, on a, on a ticket, uh, exit ticket or an assignment. So they have, mm -hmm. they were super unfamiliar with that, but they did pretty good because I think they understood it and they had the experience with the computers. You, you've done exit tickets on the computers before, right? Yes. Do you think that helped them? I think it did. I, I try my best to use the new question types that I think that they're going to see um but I had never done more than one in line choice so I think that one was the new one but yeah. I I've tried to adjust it to what questions are going to be asked or like the question types how they do with the fill fill in the fill in the blank question types I had yeah. a few yeah. that wanted to put like the whole thing like a whole number sentence mm -hmm. um but that question overall was one of my low ones but yeah, because it's it's always going to be one because they they don't have any answer choices to to pick from, yeah. and I think that's kind of what TE well from the trainings that we've been to that's sort of along the lines where TEA wants to go to where they want to mm -hmm. get rid of the looking at the answer choices yeah. and picking some out from that. So, um, and I'm sorry, I'm looking over here to my this monitor, but I have two, so if you don't, okay. <laughs> I apologize, okay. just like last time. Well, I'm glad you had a good week, and thank you for meeting me, because I know how hectic it, it is, and then we have Christmas programs tomorrow, and I truly appreciate you being here. So we're going to go ahead and start the meeting. Today, on our agenda, we are going to be talking about a few things uh, regarding the benchmark that we just had. So since you are a new STAR teacher, there's a few things um, that I wanted to review of for as far as data collection and data analysis, after we take any mock or benchmark, we look at our data and we try to um, use it to plan ahead in our unit calendar to make sure that any ticks that were missed throughout the benchmark are still targeted because our lessons are going to keep going. We're going to target different to topics the rest of the year, but you really want to make sure that the ones that are, were missed in the benchmark are getting hit throughout the year so that we don't leave them behind. You know, yeah, um, yeah. familiarity and practice with those takes is going to be really important, especially for mm -hmm. the new start test. But let me go ahead and pull up your data. And you have your SWAM page, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me pull up your data. Okay, so overall, your data looked, it looked good. It was a really good, for it being a new test, for it being a totally new, um, a new test on the computer, I, I, I truly believe that they did really good. How, how do you think they did? Um, I guess I was expecting a little bit higher, but I think looking at the data, I think they did 
fairly well, considering, right? Considering grades from other campuses, but I think we've, we've, we managed fairly well, I would say. So I was able to gain a little bit of access to the other campuses and we, we scored really close to a lot of the other campuses in third grade, which is, it's really good. You should be really proud of that. You know, um, I'm glad that you have really high expectations for yourself, but also take it as a win. You know, when you're, when you're comparing yourself to other people in the district, your hard work doesn't go unnoticed as, any, as well. So it's going to get better. It's going to get um, a lot higher. It's new for, think about it. It's new for them and it's new for you. So it's, it's definitely, and you're competing up there um, the same scale as teachers who've had experience. So just yeah. think about that whenever you're looking at your results. And it's honestly about what you can do from here on out. So first test, mm, I've told you before, tell you again, there's nowhere to go but up, especially for the first test. First so time. let's look, I'm going to share my screen real quick. So I have your scores here, do you see them? Yes. Okay. So the bulk of it, it looks really, really good. It ha You had two perfect scores, Alan Baez and Mateo Jimenez. So that's awesome. You had a lot of masters. Look at these, all of these are masters. And I believe the cutoff point is, let me highlight these. So these are definitely masters. And our cutoff point for this star test was 70, was a cutoff point? 75, let me check real quick. Mm -hmm. Out here. Do you remember what your cutoff point was for meets and masters? I think it was 70.25, I'm not sure. Okay, so it's 70.5, you have all the way, over here that wow that's awesome so even if those numbers brought you down look at all of those kids who are above track so that's really good um now we go into approaches which is all the way down to our 53 53 is usually the cutoff so oops that should have been green well, let's do yellow, like yellow for approaches. I think it's just something that's stuck with me since the beginning, <laughs> that yellow's approaches. All right, so overall, all of these pass, and that's a really, really, really good chunk. Very, very good chunk. And your numbers, do you have your SWAM um, document okay. filled in? Let me start. I, I have most of it, and I was missing a few, only because of EdSight. Uh, uh, let me share my screen. So it says that I cannot share my screen. Okay. So this, can you see what I am showing? No. Okay. Let me zoom it out a little bit. Okay. All right. So we have your four classes and looking at your approaches and did not meet. Okay, and you calculated your approaches, your meets, your masters, and your did not meets. So overall, you had 71% of your class pass. Is that correct? Yes. That's really good. Awesome. So 71%. Then you have your emergent bilingual students with 60% uh, approaches. You had some meets and some masters. So that's really good because those numbers are actually going to count. Um, it's either double points. It's usually double points or three points, depending on their classification towards the end of the end of year um, A rating. And we, of course, our specimens as well. We have 50% approaches. So we do have that 50% did not meet, but they are, those are also going to be categorized as points for us. So that's really good. Let's see. And it looks like you have the data for all four classes. Were you able to put all the data? Yes. Okay. Well, that's really good. 
So overall, you have 71 approaches, you had 20 meets, and you had 8% mastery. So then if I'm making the calculations correct, you were from the 90, 60, 30. Hold on a second. All right. So you are at 71 approaches. Do you know how to calculate your 90, 60, 30? I don't know how to do it exactly, honestly. Okay. So the first number, which is a 90, comes from your approaches, masters, and meets all combined. So this is a this is already a percentage, but this is a whole percentage. You usually do it over here on this side. I don't know if you can't see my mouse. Right here. Yes. So then you take the percentages of your masters, meets, and approaches, and you put them together. I think, I think that's what I did. 51 okay. plus. You did 51 oh. plus 12 plus eight. Yeah, that gets your 71. So that's your 71%. Mm -hmm. And then the middle number from the 90, 60, the 60 part is going to be your meets and masters together. So then, not your meets and masters, sorry, it's your masters and your meets. So that's 12 plus eight, which gives you 20. And then the very last number is your masters, which is 8%. So overall you scored 71, 20, and eight. So the biggest number that I can, the two biggest numbers that I can see, right, that are crucial because the more, the more masters you have, so you have right now 71, 20, and 8. So let me, no, I want you to keep showing the screen. So you have 71, 20, and 8. So our goal is to make the 71 and 90. So how can we accomplish that? How can we make all of those numbers rise up a little bit? Um, I would say pushing those do not meet. That when we had a lot of students who barely missed the mark, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, pushing them to approaches. For sure. And to get the meets and masters higher, pushing the approaches to meets, pushing the meets to masters. So our priority, yes, it, it's always for everybody to pass. It's always for getting those did not meets to go into approaches. And of course, this year, we're also going to uh, consider the jumps in the scale that they're making. So if they were low did not meets, you would go, uh, and if they jumped up to say approaches, they skipped high did not meets, they went to approaches. So that would be counted as two points. So for every level they skip, it's going to be counted um, as a point as well the new the new uh, system that we're doing this year so mm -hmm. that's definitely one thing and we've already been targeting that with tutoring you've been doing tutoring you have in school tutoring with all uh, our critical students so that is already a push that we're doing but what i'm seeing is the 20 the 20 percent that i have in the middle mm -hmm. if we push those students to get masters you already have those students in the middle. Those That number won't change. Of course, we want it to go higher, right? You're also going to get your master's number to go higher as well. So now we have to implement a system to get our meets into master's, to pick up both your master's. Um, and of course, we want more students to have meets too. So our focus, as apart from what we already have for our critical students, right, to get approaches, is to get our approaches to move to meets and our meets to move to masters so that both of those numbers can go up. The more people you push across the line, the more points you're going to get, end up getting, and they they do need, they do need um, more help as well. So utilizing okay. uh, tutoring and other, other stuff, we're going to talk about a little bit about it right now, but what we can do in class to make sure that those numbers go up and moving forward. For sure. So definitely we're still going to be targeting those students for uh, approaches to make sure that they hit approaches so that our first number can hit 90, but definitely moving our approaches that we have right now 
into our our meets and our masters moving forward. It's always I always um we always begin the school year kind of on that track. We're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing um, in the beginning with all this tutoring. Now that we have numbers before we go into uh, different teaks, it's really good to, to form a plan for that. So now let's talk about the teaks. Do you have the teak analysis by any chance? Um, I have the, well, here at the bottom where it says the bright spot, so the ones that were successful. Yes. And then I also have the other ones. So we'll start with this one. So these are the three that I identified as the highest performing questions from, from the semester exam. Mm -hmm. um, question number three, five, and six. Okay. Um, starting with 3.4E was the highest performing with 86.75% of students uh, getting the answer correctly. Um, so wow. the analysis or my actions, so I, I mentioned there how when I introduced multiplication and division, um, I know that one of the very first ways we did it was by using arrays or skip counting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've made a lot of visuals with the kids where I'm showing like all the different ways that we can look at a multiplication problem, starting with skip counting, starting with jumps on a number line, starting with or continuing on with arrays, and then like addressing equal groups and things like that. So being mm -hmm. able to show them all of those things when it's just one little simple sentence, I think it was very helpful. Um, and for the student actions, when I was checking over their work, I noticed what a lot of them were doing was going through each um, letter. So it was an, a multiple choice question. They were mm -hmm. going through each answer choice and they were actually solving for it. So they were doing the skips on a number line for A, they were doing the equal groups for B, and then okay. checking to see if that's what would give the answer for the question. Um, and they were able to be successful with it. That's, that's awesome. So, and even by looking at their work, you can tell that they for sure know that it's the answer because they've worked each one out. So that's, that was really good. So that's definitely a high, good job. And number five was number six was so, Everything here looks really good. What actions in class do you think led, led to those top high performing questions? Aside from writing out each answer choice. Well, I think additionally with the ones that they, they performed really on, well on. So I think one of the struggling ones or both of those 3.4H and 3.4F were ones that we were, I, what I identified through their topic quizzes and their, you know, mid-module exams that were very low in performance. They were okay. struggling a lot with them. So um, it definitely took a lot of backwards planning. Yes, it did. I, I had to go back and, and really check to see what was what was mis the mistake. And I think I what I did with those, especially especially 3.4H, was I adjusted the criteria for success. Mm -hmm. um, and whereas before it had like five simple steps, I cut it down. Um, to reading, finding important information, and starting with the get. Whereas before, what they were doing was they were immediately trying to find their answer or like starting with the get. They weren't even reading the problem. Um, so I really pushed for them to read first. That's that good. That's awesome. It, it, and it definitely shows. How are the notes? Where Have you been able to look, look through your grid papers? I have. And so for those, they were even, for 3.4H, that one was, um, I, I don't remember what, what question was, but it, oh, it was the inline choice um, okay. where they had to, it was like a question, it was like 48 uh, pies and he wanted to divide them into five equal shelves. Um, and so they needed to identify a number sentence and the answer. Oh, and so I saw, them, I saw them able to draw, write their information. So finding the G, the E, the T, Writing their, what we do on the side, it's like a, aside from the GET, they do a multiply, multiply, divide that tells them what they're going to do. Um, and so they were able to really quick identify it as a division sentence. Mm -hmm. And then the next step would be for them to solve it. So a quick way for them to, that they divide, um, well, with me at least, is rather than having to draw 48 pies and then putting them into five equal groups, I've taught them to skip count by the number of groups up until that number. It was like eight or six. I think it was definitely eight. time saving too. I can see how yes. I would be frustrated drawing 45, but I, I like how you still gave it 
an option. Do you have anybody draw the 45 actually? Do you have any students? I had a few who did arrays. So they the picture was not in an array form. It was just a picture of pies that were all over the place. So I had some students that made their five or their their six um shelves and then equally distribute them. So that was a cool thing to see as well. That that's they remember. Good. That's divide. good because that tells me that their frame of thinking and the way you're teaching them, you're giving them different avenues of what are different ways for them to solve it. And that comes from repetition, that comes from asking, how do you think we should solve it? And that's and that's 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 really good. Um, not all students solve one way, but you can also see the structure. Like, so I'm assuming they all were, despite what method they took to solve it, they all knew to do the words, they all knew how to do the, the get on the side. So it, it, it was still all uh, formulate, formed the way you wanted it. It was all repetition. That's what I see. And I can see how that led to success in these questions. And that's something to consider in a bit when we go over our low performing questions, because there, there are some times where our low performing questions are questions that are low because, and it happens, it happens all the time. These teaks slip through our fingers. Um, multiplication division always get the most, uh, <laughs> the most stress out of teachers, even me. I always focus on multiplication division, multiplication division, because to me, and I don't know why, but to me, I feel like it takes priority <laughs> over yeah, yeah. everything else because if you don't have multiply and divide you know i know that it carries on over to the other um grade levels but in reality all these teaks do carry over so sometimes they slip through, through the cracks and all they need is just that they just need structure um they need to know how to solve it whenever they see it so <laughs> they, this is really good the percentages are really really high uh how about our let's talk about our low performance questions so, so the one that i identified i'm sorry i can hear my echo let me lower it down a little bit Okay. Um, so the ones that I identified, um, starting with the multiple choice, um, I identified uh, number seven, number nine, and number 11. The teaks for number seven being 3.4K, which is a commonly most missed for, for third grade. Um, and so oh, I, what I yeah. wrote, the rationale, um, I put that there was a two-step, it was a two-step multiplication division problems. Um, students correctly identified the first step, which was the first thing that they needed to do, but they failed to continue on. Mm -hmm. So had they understood that it was a two-step multiplication problem, they would have been fine, and especially because this is something that we have done. I mean, 3.4K is, is a teak that I really, I mean, we had been low on in our topic quizzes and our, our mid-modules, end of modules, well, not mid-modules, end of modules. And so it was, that one was cool. Hurt me, hurt me to my heart. Now, let me tell you something about that teak. This question, this teak, it has, is very similar to a teak in fourth grade that always scores low as well, always. It's it's the two-step problems and it, it's not limited to the multiplication division in fourth grade. They do up to three-step uh, problems at one point. <laughs> and it becomes very difficult because you do have the the bilingual students, uh, the emergent bilingual students who, you know, try as they might, they don't have the same reading skills as some of the yeah, other yeah. students. So uh, for one, you're trying to teach them English, how to read this, the sentence, and the other, you're trying to get them to really comprehend, you what know, how, is. yeah, like what, what it's trying to say. And um, keywords, I, I, I like keywords. I know we're not supposed to, you shouldn't be dependent on them. The keywords yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely help there, but it is, it's a teak that is still, it's struggle, and you see it struggling all through third, fourth, and fifth. I, I, I've seen it in fifth grade too. So the, how, how I see that working is more exposure. So this is also one that personally, when I teach it, I know that I don't spend as much time as I want to on there because it's just so complicated and I tend to be like, okay, well, let's just move on. Like, um, I, I, I'm i still stuck on the multiplication. How can I do a two-step problem with division? But I found that the more repetition they have with the this, this style of question where they have to look at hints in the story and figure out what's going on there, the better. So for that, just exposure. Every, uh, every week, 
a do now, a do now, a do now that has at least one problem where you have to tell them like, what is going on? Tell me what, what is going on first. Now write an equation, write the equation first. You walk around, see which, what part that they're struggling with. So for that, definitely, definitely exposure. It's something that we always struggle with. Now, 3.4a, it's a subtraction problem. Students have repeatedly failed with this type of question because of the repetitiveness of multiplication and division in math lessons. Students failed to identify that, the, that they are to first at January and March and a lack of repeated practice with addition and subtraction. So is this also a two-step? Excuse me? Is this also a two-step problem or? So, no, these were just one step. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, this one was the lowest performing TEEK, which was 16% of students getting it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, what had happened is, is that it was asking for the difference. So just like, as you said before, the, the these TEEK slipped through our fingers completely. Um, and especially because with the program that we have been teaching, it has just been a focus on multiplication and division that we haven't had a chance to go back into the addition and subtraction of these big numbers. Mm -hmm. And so it was a it was a subtraction problem that even said in the question, find the difference of, and that threw them off. They were trying to add it. And I think that's, if, if when I went back to look at their stuff, all of them were adding it. They were adding it, getting, mm -hmm. um, getting the incorrect answer by like 200. Yeah. But they were all making, it was the same misconception. Yeah, I I agree. It's, it definitely goes back to reading what it, what it says. And this sounds also, because I have seen the third grade math problem. It's more out of math problems. It's more analytical, straightforward, you know, do this, do that kind of test. And this seems like it was a, a, a story. Was this like a story type of question? It, it wasn't. It was like um, it was a question that that had like a table of trees, and it said there were in January they had cut down seven hundred and eighty nine trees. In March they cut down two hundred and eighty nine trees. What is the difference between how many trees were cut down in March and versus in April or you know mm -hmm. something like that? Okay, I can see how that could be very confusing. Yeah, they wanted to multiply, and they were like, we haven't multiplied three numbers. I'm like, it's because you're not multiplying. <laughs> so what action step are you, would you would you see taking for this problem? I would say more opportunities, of, um, obviously, right? I do nows, even a fluency activity. Flu I think them using it as a fluency would, would help them, even just really quick identifying, you know, when you see this word, it means what? When you see this, it means, you know, things I like agree. that. Things you see would definitely help, I, I feel. I agree. I, I agree that all of these, I'm looking at number 11 uh, for the multiplication sentence. And you said the students chose a distractor. Yes. Which identifies a correct number of small pizzas as described, but the question asks for large pizzas. So definitely exposure and definitely... I'm assuming that you already went over like picking out distractors, kind of scratching them out, right? But yeah. a lot, of, a lot of this, <clears throat> besides the exposure part, can really be um, targeted with open-ended question types, where there is an answer choices first, just to make sure that they're analyzing the reading part first, because a lot of these. <laughs> Are, they sound very confusing. Like to a child, if you're reading this, the whole story is about pandas, but then it's asking about koalas. And mm -hmm. you're distracted by the pandas and you had no idea there was a koala in the story because they're trying, they're literally trying to distract you. And I like I just put distract in there because that, that's really what it is. Yeah. So exposure, getting rid of the answer choices sometimes. I don't want to get rid of the strategies that you have currently for the start test because it can be very useful you know mm -hmm. um especially when you're multiplication multiplying dividing if all the numbers are small then you know you're dividing it's vice versa but i don't want them to rely on that because the minute they start relying on that the minute their brain shuts a little uh parts of their brain shuts down for analyzing the problem and you're not mm -hmm. exercising that muscle it's kind of like a muscle in your brain you know if you have these kids just focused on 
And I've seen it with my kids. And it was and it's been a mistake that I've made that I was reflecting on just this past week. That they're I was looking at their work and their multiplication and division, they were flawless, beautiful, because we practiced and practiced and practiced so much. I wanted to make sure that they had that core. And I knew that if they had that core of that math done, regardless of how, how they interpret it or whatever, that it was going to be uh, correct. So I was looking mm -hmm. at their papers and their math and their division was perfect, but they were doing multiplication for a division problem because they weren't, I wasn't exercising that part of their brain. I wasn't okay. focusing so much on the, uh, the exposure of the reading sentences, trying to figure out what it was. I was doing it, of course, every now and then, but I, I thought what was more important was multiplication. So that could definitely be helpful. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit when we go into our unit calendar. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So that was top missed multiple choice questions. Now let's go down to the tech and hats. So, and it's so okay. I, wasn't, I wasn't able to accurately get the percentages only because EdSight had crashed when I was doing this. Mm -hmm. um, but this one, I, I don't know if this one, I think I might have missed. Yes, question number nine, I think I confused it with question 11. This number 13 was not a multiple choice answer the way that I had said it. This one, number 13, was about the trees that I was telling you. Okay. Or that I was I was just speaking about. So this is the one where they were um, adding when they were supposed to subtract. Um, mm -hmm. And so the correct answer was 489. The most common answer that was answered was 789. So, but, and they were, they were just adding um, with the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. And so just the same thing going back to, to more fluency with those, but it, it goes back to number nine as well, because they're both addition problems or subtraction problems. Mm -hmm. And that's where the most common misconception was, but there was no um, issue plugging in the numbers. So they were all able to use okay. the tech hands, um, you know, putting in the numbers. And that comes from the, the constant repetition of using your our computers. Yes. For X tickets. And I think that's an overall strength in the whole campus. I know um, talking to other teachers that there were a lot of students who were very confused on the question, the tech enhanced question types. They were because they weren't, they were never, um, they were never practiced. So that's really okay. good. I'm glad that they didn't have that trouble. And it's okay if we haven't, we haven't finished. Um, it's a very long document, but from memory, is there another tech enhanced question that you think that they struggled with as far as inputting? It would be this last one. So this last one was a drag and drop Ooh, and their one. computers was not, their computers, the touch screen was not allowing them to touch them and drag them. They weren't even able to use the, the touch pad. So what was happening was that they had, I think EdSide has like a pre-filled like box where they were supposed to go into. And if the kids weren't putting them there, it wouldn't stay. So they were kind of having trouble putting them in order um, because when they would put one like too close to the other one, it would switch mm. or like if they were putting it to this side, it would go this way. You know, it was, it was hard, mm. harder for them. So I don't think it was so much the misconception of the question, but the inability to correctly drag and drop with their computers. And that one, that one is tough because I, I don't know about you, but I have yet to find a way to make a question similar to that on that side. You, we, I've been trying, I've been figuring it out. I know how to make questions that are um, typed in, I have two, two, question, two answer questions. So I've pretty much figured out everything else, but I could not for the life of me figure out how to do the drag and drop. So my kids did not have a lot of practice. And yeah. my students also, they, my students, um, they get these type of questions too, but they have two different kinds of questions where they have to organize them from smallest to greatest or greatest to least, it depends. So mm -hmm. in, in my case, it was from smallest to greatest, but the boxes were put in a way where a lot, I had a lot of students um, afterwards saying, well, I didn't know if it was smallest to greatest this way or smallest to greatest that way. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean, okay, I need to teach them left to right, left to right, always left to right. That's yeah. the word. And that, I think that was another part that was tricky because mine asked for smallest to greatest, but it even included, so I, the way they formatted the question was answer the question, they had the graph, they and what the students were doing was actually writing it down on their grid paper, thankfully, so they were able to That's directly awesome. put them in order. But what was happening was when they were going to EdSide, it said smallest to greatest with mm -hmm. an error. 
right? But I don't think that they understood smallest goes over here mm -hmm. and greatest. I think that they automatically assume want to do greatest to least. Mm -hmm. But then I guess that's more of a reading error rather than a comprehension error rather than like a student work error, I guess. I agree. All right. So now we're going to, we're going to pause here and we are going to open up the unit calendar. So I'm going to pause it here. Go ahead and open that up and then we'll get right back to it. Do I need to stop sharing the screen? Yes. Okay. I'm going to unmute you. All right. So now let's go ahead and pull up the unit calendar that we had reviewed. I'm going to go ahead and give you control. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's going to look a little dark because of the MacBook. One. So here is the unit calendar that I was able to create. So up here, I don't have the month on it, but this is for um, next week, mm -hmm. um, which is just December 12th through 16th. Um, yeah. It cuts up, it cuts down right here. This is nothing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay. So the goal for unit calendars, it looks it looks really good. And you follow the template. Now, the goal for you in the unit the unit calendar moving forward after a mock test is to get those low teaks, anything that is below 75%. So any question that score below 75%, even if 75% happens to be your mm -hmm. high at the moment, they need to be retaught. Usually we do reteach lessons um, after your actual lesson. Um, so we're going to be taking away your fluency from the lesson. Mm -hmm. And we're going to focus on content development, uh, problem set, making sure to have students engage in those open-ended uh, type of criteria questions to target what we already saw and more repetition, more repetition. And the last 15, 20 minutes of class, you are going to do a reteach. The reteach is going to be based off the TEKS, and that's why the calendar is set up this way. So we have your your reteach topic. So this is for next week. So if we go to January, over here in the bottom, January has the reteach lesson, a little space right here in the bottom, right here in the bottom of your lesson. So. And also oh, yeah. have the Dreambox Teaks that is aligned to the, the lesson of the day. So that it has to be combined to module five, lesson seven. Then you're going to dive into your reteach lesson. So this is where your document, the, doc the SWAM document that we had is going to go into place. So you already took the steps to analyze data. We talked about it a little bit more. Um, of course, you're going to talk about it a little bit more with your actual coach. Um, but you are going to create a month ahead a unit calendar that targets those teaks, and you need to start preparing uh, yourself for them. Aside from this, we're also going to target, um, like I had mentioned before, the students who are in approaches and needs mm -hmm. to push to masters and needs as well. And we're going to do that in in school tutoring. So our in school tutoring from now on is going to be focused on those students, the students that you can push up further. After school tutoring, we'll be focused more on HP forty five students and your low your um, low performing students to make sure that um, we target both of them. Now in class, I would like you to during the reteach lesson um, focus on building up their experience with reading comprehension. The tougher the question looks, I don't want you to fray away from it. I want you to teach them how to break it down because essentially that's what this test is, is aiming to do. This test is aiming to hit them with the harder, more developed questions, and they're going to need more experience with that. And you really need to break down every step of the way. And really, like we mentioned before, those little that little muscle needs to be um, they need exercise in that little muscle, that little thinking muscle. So maybe you can um, start off the lesson like with that, do a few rounds of 
what do you think is going on? What do you think we have to do in order to solve this? And then kind of go into another question where you discuss it again, but I'd go into the problem solving part and then focus on the problem solving portion. Um, doing your laps around this time is also going to be very important. So doing your laps during your lesson from now on and your reteach lessons are going to be very, very important. Make sure that you're, um, you have your criteria of success in front of you and you know exactly where they're having trouble with. So for example, earlier uh, we had said that um, for the fill in the blank question, they were, instead of subtracting, they were adding. Yes. That was going on. So that tells me that while you were doing, you were doing that lesson, maybe there's a, a specific part in your criteria for success that they were all getting wrong or they were all having trouble with, but it wasn't stopped and retaught at that specific moment. So sure. by implementing it right now with your current lesson, you're going to prevent further mishaps. Okay. okay. So this is your unit calendar. Um, do you have any questions about filling this in? No, so, or yes, I do actually. <laughs> I don't know why I said no. Um, so just filling in, um, obviously the do now is what was, well, like for example, what was taught on Monday, which would be a spiral back to 3.4K here, for example, right? Here, the reteach lesson would be a lowest teak. And then the do now would not be, it would be based on the lesson of the day, correct? Or the retaught, the reteach. They can go one of both ways. So. Okay. Last year, I know that we started um, doing our do nows and supplementing them with the the, test, the reteach lessons from the last the last day. But that mm -hmm. was more towards the end of the year. So I don't know necessarily if your manager wants to start off with that so early in the year. In my opinion, I think that would be best. That way, they get the experience. You know how it is with. Um, with students where it's easy for them to answer questions when you've just gone over it, just gone over it. So this is really going to be true data on whether or not those retaught lessons is actually fruitful, you know? So mm -hmm. in in my recommendation, I would suggest that your do nows are focused on the retaught lessons from the day before. Um, okay. Ideally, that's if they're doing well and you're getting data still from the problem sets of your actual lesson, because you still need that data. Um, I would focus then on the exit ticket of the actual of the actual day for mm -hmm. that data and the do now as you uh, to reflect your the data from the retail lessons. Okay. Yeah. But it, it really just depends on, on your manager. So then and your multiplication charts, you are doing them once a week. Multiplication charts? Yeah. Mm, well, yes, we were during our fluency for the most part, we were focusing on the numbers that they were having trouble with. So, for mm -hmm. example, for before we were taking our um, semester exam, we were focusing on the six, sevens, eights, and nines. I'm um, mm -hmm. having them do their skip counting like that. Um, but they are, we do the complete um, chart mm -hmm. through 10. Um, we do it pretty much every Thursday and Friday, both days. So, okay. two times. So maybe, um, and they, 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 you don't see any problem, you didn't see any problem with their multiplication charts throughout the test? I saw only with their eights. The eights are the ones that are giving them trouble. So then let's definitely scale back on the amount of times that they do the multiplication. You don't want to take it completely away because it's really, it's vital to their test and they know that they're supposed to do it the first, thing that, the first time they, they take the test, the first um, few minutes. So you definitely don't want to take it out of your agenda completely, but if they're only struggling with the eights, I would suggest doing it, you know, every Monday um, mm -hmm. so that they have the multiplication chart for the week and maybe having them do only three columns. So printing out numbers one through 10 and having the three column or the, the, the most difficult ones, the, the eights, the threes, or the sevens, having them, those blank and giving them just five minutes to fill in those so they can get that practice. And using the rest of your fluency time on other other things that they they need help with. So, I this since it's a fluency time, it should be be very quick. So I wouldn't really recommend like reading comprehension skills. More like the making sure the adding and subtraction 
is 100%. The multiplication and, and division is 100%. So little, like little quick, little tidbits of um, information and um, uh, exercises for them to do. Yeah. Just so that you, they don't lose those skills because I know that you're entering fractions and you're going to be entering different um, content soon. So you don't want them to forget those skills either because it's like I said, muscle in your brain, you need exercise every now and then. Okay. So we'll definitely do that. So then here on your juniors and fluencies, then they will be have they will have to be filled out. I mean, tell me exactly what you're going to do for your now, exactly what you're going to do for your fluency. Um, since obviously on Mondays or the first day of the weeks, technically this would be a Tuesday on January third, tenth, third, tenth. We come back. There's not going to be a do now. So on Mondays uh, for that do now, you could put multiplications, focusing on column, so, so, and so. Like that's going to be your do now for Monday because there was no previous retop lesson the day before because you're coming back from um, the weekend. Um, but other than that, your scores look really good. Keep it up. You're, it's going to get better and better. It's already better. Um, and the kids, they look like they're doing good. I observed your classroom. And like I said, I, I was very impressed. Um, this, they're just little itty bitty little tidbits that can be very beneficial to them. And it just comes from practice. And um, okay. who better to enforce that practice than the teacher, right? Okay. So you're gonna do amazing. Thank you so much for meeting with me. I hope this was helpful for your upcoming SWAM meeting, kind of. It gives you a gist of what's gonna be taught, um, talked about, kind of give you ideas. Um, of course, it's all up to your manager, but it's, it's looking really good. And I, I feel like you have a a great rest of the year until the next month. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna leave it here. Thank you and goodbye.